Welcome back to the Popperian Podcast. And I have today's guest in front of me. This is Joseph Agassi. Joseph, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And um, I was going to do a long biography and uh, read out your biography before I inter- introduced you. And after the 16th or 17th university on the list, I gave up. And um, I'll just say uh, it's a, a very healthy resume and, of course, a student of Karl Popper as well. And I believe you're still Emeritus Professor at Tel Aviv and uh, York? And York, yes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I might start at the beginning. And in front of me, I have your book, which is The Gentle Art of Philosophical Polemics. And um, you write, you are a young man in Jerusalem studying uh, science, and you looked across and you saw that this man, Karl Popper, was, uh, in your words, uh, amazingly underestimated. And yet you went to London and then you chose to study under him. So uh, no, why? No, 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 not true. When I went to London, I didn't know, that, didn't know anything about him. I went to London to study under the only philosopher of science in London. Who was that? I forget his name just now. It will come to me. Uh, So why? Mm. University College. And first of all, the course in history and philosophy of science was mostly history of science. Secondly, I corrected mistakes of my lecturers in the lecture, Mm. not knowing that in England it doesn't, it isn't done. Mm. (laughs) And uh, so I, mm. I was lost. I was desperate. My wife was studying at the London School of Economics, and people told me to go and see Karl Popper, and I didn't know who he was, so I didn't want to see him. But I read a paper of his, and before I finished the paper, I knew I was going to be his student. What was it about that paper that made you make the that? The nature of philosophical problems. You see, I was interested in metaphysics mm. all the time. And metaphysics always had a bad name. And here I found somebody who took metaphysics seriously. That was enough for me. Let's start with there. And that's, uh, I'm, I might um, take a step forward. And um, what were your years like um, with him as your teacher? Because I'm, I, I'll, I'll warn you, I'm getting towards the point where you have a slight fallen out with him over his book, Objective Knowledge. So what was it like before um, that and as 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 his uh, as his student. When I <clears throat> came to the London School of Economics, I joined his seminar. He was at the doctor's appointment, so his second in command, J. O. Wisdom, uh, let me in, and there was a free discussion. Wisdom was the best chairperson I ever met. And he conducted the discussion magnificently. And then Popper entered, and the atmosphere completely changed, and I didn't notice it. I was in the middle of a sentence, and I went on. I said something very unimportant, and he said, you are a charlatan. How did you take that? Because that's that's not just um, saying you're wrong. That's implying something about your character, isn't it? At the end of the seminar, when I was on my way out, he stood at the door, he stopped me and I said, and he said, who are you? And I said, my name is Joseph Agassi and I need your help. He told me later when we became close and so on, that you could knock him down with a feather. And he was, he couldn't believe that I ignored his insult completely. Why did you make the transition from science? Because yeah, I believe your master's was in science and your undergraduate was in science. What was, why the transition to the philosophy of science? First of all, I came to science from philosophy. I, when I was 17, I read Arthur Stanley Eddington, The Nature of the Physical World. And first of all, it fascinated me. Secondly, I knew he was wrong. He was an instrumentalist. And I knew he was wrong. 
And I had no idea what instrumentalism was and why I thought it was wrong. I just felt very strongly that I had to argue with him. And I knew that for that I needed science. And so I went and registered in the science department, but not because I wanted to be a physicist, but because I wanted to know physics. And my teachers hated me, nothing personal. They just couldn't take it. They wanted students in physics. They wanted to train the next generation and not to have, you know, a free rider like me. I have a paper of yours in front of me. I downloaded a few of your other papers just in context. And this one is called The Role of the, of the Philosopher Among Scientists, uh, Nuance, uh, Nuisance or Necessity. So do, do, do scientists really need the philosophers of science? Because I know a lot of them will, will, will simply say we may not understand it, but we know since how to do refer, it. Since you refer to this paper, let me say uh, it was a response to the fact that scientists are not aware of the fact that they do have a philosophy of science and a wrong one. And <laughs> I found it difficult to approach a scientist and talk about philosophy. I remember distinctly Max Born, who was a great hero of mine, came to London and gave a talk. And he attacked Schrodinger's what is quantum jump? And he said, not only Schrodinger was wrong, but Schrodinger was wrong raising the question. And I wrote a note about it, half a page long or so, saying that this is a, an obscurantist attitude, not deserving of such a person. I went to Bonn afterwards and I said, I wanted to be your student doing a philosophical thing. And he said, you be a scientist and when you are too old to do science, then you do philosophy, which I found unacceptable. And I showed Papa what I wrote about Born and Papa said, that's your doctorate. If there is, you said, if, if there is so little, um understanding within the scientific community about how science is actually done. How do yeah. they get it done then? <laughs> this is... I, I believe this is one of the, the criticisms that Kuhn, I, I think Kuhn got involved with this at a certain point. And was yeah, trying to... It's a wonderful question. Imagine yourself somebody playing music and you ask him what instrument you are playing and he says a guitar and you say, no, that's not a guitar, it's a piano. If I told you this story, you'd say it's too fantastic. It, it, it won't pass. You can't even write it in a piece of fiction. And yet, whereas all physicists say, I am looking for a confirmation for my hypothesis, Popper says, no, you are trying to refute it. Which is like saying you're not playing a guitar, you're playing a piano. It's unbelievable. Mm. How come all scientists have the wrong attitude about what science is. And yet it goes on like that. Yeah. Let me go on on this uh, line just a yeah. second more. Papa had a great rule, always defend the thesis before you attack it. I find this one of the most beautiful, wonderful things I learned from Papa. And yet Papa never defended inductivism. I did it in my doctorate. I, I don't mean the time in inductivism. Yeah, no, I no, hope I'm, no, I understand. Before criticizing, you have to defend it. And Popper never did, never said a good word of inductivism. He said he was an anti-inductivist since he was 17, which is untrue, by the way. He was inductivist when he was 23, 4. Do you think he paid a price for not um, um, defending inductivism? I know there's certain the points. Highest, the highest po price possible, a tacit ostracism. There's a point later on in, in, in your writing, and you talk about Popper when he talks about corroboration. And yes. uh, for me, this is this is one of those ones that a lot of people get into. And you yeah. say when, when Popper talks about cor uh, corroboration, 
he is he's dipping into inductivism, the whiffs of inductivism. So he said he said there is a whiff of inductivism there. Yes, mm. I didn't say that. Mm. So I, do you, please. No, no, I'm not reading the Bible. Go on. <laughs> do so. Do 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 you think Popper misunderstood? inductivism to a degree or at least misunderstood some of the nuances in inductivism by failing to steal man as I don't best know. he could. I, I had a critique of Popper that he never heard, although I tried to tell him a few times. He said science is conjectures and refutations. Mm. And I asked him, don't you really mean conjectures, confirmation and refutations? You have to decide between these two. If you have a, a whiff of inductivism, then it's conjectures Corroboration and refutation. And he said, corroboration is necessary to encourage research. Now, I found this in total discord with the whole of what Popper did, which was not psychologistic. And here he introduces psychology all of a sudden. Popper in Logic de Forschung said, the first thing to know is that you cannot use psychology in your methodology, because this is secular. Methodology has to apply to psychology, not psychology to methodology, which I think is wonderful, wonderful. And then he did that when we, he talked about a whiff of inductivism. This, um, to stick on Thomas Kuhn for a minute here, because you go through all, all the critics of Popper, and this is nice. Um, Potter Kuhn focuses on, I think it's um, the acquiescence of scientists or the acquiescence of people towards theory. You're right, the that Kuhn thinks the body of a theory is that which is acqu acquiesced by the practitioners of science. Um, Let me take a step back. Kuhn says a field of research becomes a subject and a scientific one if and when it has a paradigm, but not otherwise. And a paradigm involves agreement. Of a kind, or no, just a paradigm. Paradigm means <clears throat> para is chief and dime is digma, a uh, example. <clears throat> paradigm means chief example, or rubber step example is the proper English expression. And what Kuhn did, he took it from Polanyi. Polanyi said, You recognize, but you cannot articulate. This is what Polanyi called personal knowledge. That was his contribution to methodology. And Kuhn followed Polanyi. He even acknowledged to Polanyi before he became Kuhn. There is no doubt that there are such cases where you have a, an example rather than a theory that it exemplifies. The theory develops later. First, you have an example which you think is very important. <clears throat> Polanyi and Kuhn never said why, but Popper did. He said it's a refutation. So you need a new theory for it. And before you have a new theory, you try to move about to see things. Uh, <clears throat> really, Polanyi and Kuhn did heuristic. And Popper said in his Logic de Forsum, <clears throat> my study ignores heuristic completely. And so there is, hmm. there is here no contradiction, but just, yeah, I don't know. So does Popper miss no. something then? If I, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm reading, I was reading through your analysis no, of Kuhn. Ahead. Do you think Popper missed something um, by not um, digging into the, the, the full history of science the and looking missed, at it in that long view? Yeah, the word miss is here ambiguous. Whatever you do, you miss other things. This is opportunity cost. You can't do everything. So you decide what you do. But what you mean when miss is he should have done it and he didn't. That's a different kind of miss. Do you think he <clears> should have done it? No. I think Popper did enough. You can't say he didn't do enough. You can say, I regret he didn't have time to go into that. But no more than that. Popper paid the highest price. He was ostracized. The fact is, I never heard of him, although I was interested in what he was doing because I didn't know he was there. My interesting thing is 
he was invited to Cambridge to the most significant uh, philosophical uh, organization that was a, a very famous seminar. The Moral, the Saints, moral Sciences Club. Moral Science Club, the Saints group in the Moral Science. It, it, it was a, a club within a club. <laughs> <laughs> and Wittgenstein invited Popper to yield. And Popper came there and rather than yield, he said, there's a problem, should I yield? I'm translating it, I'm not quoting it, but that's what happened. I think Popper should not have done. I mean, if you are invited to yield and you don't want to yield, you have to overgo. <clears throat> and he did. And after this encounter, he wrote The Nature of Scientific of Philosophical Problems. And when I read his nature, I became his student. I, one more question on Kuhn before I go back to you being a student there. Um, you write that, that, that uh, Kuhn uh, largely ignored Popper in his work. And I know you talk no, about... No, no, no. You see, Kuhn said a field is scientific if and only if it has a paradigm. And now I'm writing a paradigm. Now, a paradigm is what everybody in the field accepts. And therefore, Kuhn said, I agree with Carnap. I agree with Popper. I agree with Agassi. Now, he cannot agree with Carnap and Popper. This is absurd. And yet I'm citing him. He said that he agreed with Carnap. He said that he agreed with Popper because he wanted to be the paradigm. So did he engage enough then with, with, with Popper's criticisms of him then? At least that. He did nothing. I mm. don't know what you're talking about. His book, which was one of the greatest successes in all 20th century philosophy was translated into many languages and so on, was uh, commented on by hundreds of, it was an enormous success. Now the book is short. And if yeah. you take out the examples, it's between 10 and 20 pages, yeah. the whole book. And it's mainly historical, not society. And it's so funny, Margaret Masterman of Cambridge wrote a review of the book and he said, that book uses the word paradigm in 26 different senses, <laughs> which I think is mean because if Quine is half right, then you can say this of every word. Yeah. So she poked fun at him rather than criticized him. And he took it so much to heart, he stopped using the word paradigm, but to no avail, he still identified with paradigms. Were you there at the time? I, I, I'm turning around and I got a book on my shelf, which is edited by Lakatosh. And it's about this great conference when Popper came across and uh, I'm sorry, when Kuhn came across and Popper was there. And, um, and this is wonderful, large conference. I don't think you're in the book, but were you at, at, uh, around those circles at the time of that? Lakatosh bragged that there were two people whom he disinvited and I'm one of them. Why did he disinvite you? Uh, I think si sibling rivalry is the right word. Well, let's get to some of that then, because I'm about to ask you about your review of um, um, objective knowledge. But just below it, you write that um, uh, Maurice Friedman, who commissioned your review, I think it was of conjectures, conjectures and refutations, um, he had a lot of courage. He was, um, a lot of people tried to, uh, suppress your review of this book. And you went to write, and Lakatosh did manage to suppress some of my work when, when editors were less brave. So was there a real no. clash between yourself and Lakatosh? No, never. But Lakatosh, whenever he heard that an editor accepted that paper of mine for publication, he would travel to that person and threaten that person until he got a promise to withdraw the paper regardless of what the topic was? Or was it a certain topics that he, that he thought you... Regardless of what it was, no. The content of my work interested him only as a subject of plagiarism. He Otherwise, he, he thought you were plagiarizing? No, no, he plagiarized me regularly, shamelessly. He told me so. 
that that is a theme I'm going to come to fire up in in a while as well. And um, there's Before a lot of accusations me, there as well. Yeah, let me say about Lokatos. Please. He wrote Proofs and Refutations, which is a masterpiece, which I called in my publication, The Lakatosian Revolution, and I praise it sky high. And he wrote one follow-up, a short paper, and he read it in Boston Colloquium for the Philosophy of Science. And although the paper was very good, it was a flop. And at the same week, two days later, he gave a talk at Brandeis, which was a really sheer rubbish, was an echo of my things, and it was an enormous success. And that week changed his life. I mean, the fact that he did a good job in Boston and failed, and that he did a lousy job in Brandeis and succeeded, forced him to decide, what do you want, success or seriousness? He realized that these two don't go together. <laughs> he realized it's so obvious, but he learned it that week. And he decided first to get success and then to rectify. He told me, he promised me that once he got enough success, he would remedy all the damage he had done. Now he couldn't do that because he died young. He died 52 years old. Mm. Did it affect his, um, his, um, this attitude of his, I'm assuming it must have affected his philosophy. I think at some point you said that he sat on the philosophical fence, Lakatosh. Yes, of course. The main thing is that his philosophy of mathematics is superb and his philosophy of science is rubbish. What was wrong with this philosophy of science? I mean, most people out there have this understanding it, it, that it's, it, 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 hmm. it's an echo of mine. I told you he toned down my philosophy. My philosophy directs certain questions and whether I'm right or wrong, it's not for me to say. But he, in toning down it, he lost the problem. So his philosophy of science is pontification. So it's not good. When 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 people talk about Lakatos, they often talk about his his quantification. Um, yeah, and he's trying to walk a middle ground between between Popper and this idea of of, of trying, intermediate trying reputations. Is, uh, trying is the wrong word. He did it. He succeeded. But, Until now, he's one of the most famous philosophers of science in the media. So when, when, when he speaks about tentative refutations, is, is he got something there? Is that from you? Or, or is, is, is this um, a mistake, in, uh, just an error in, in his philosophy? In refutations, he ridicules what you have just described. Hmm. In proofs and refutations, he says, this is always possible when you run away from it. Hmm. See, people forget that this kind of argument dominated the Middle Ages. The same argument about what constitutes criticism and whether always, it's possible. No, that you can always, uh, what is it, uh, uh, round the edges, trim mm. your sail to the wind is the English expression. You can always do that. For example, in the Middle Ages, they tried to compromise all things. For example, uh, uh, St. Thomas said that there is no conflict between Aristotle and Archimedes. Nowadays, it's a joke because they have discovered about 10, 20 years ago, a book by Archimedes against Aristotle. Mm. But at that time, it wasn't known. And St. Thomas tried to make compromise with them. Whereas Galileo says of his teacher is that his great discovery was the conflict between Archimedes and Aristotle. He said his teacher took the wrong side, but that doesn't matter. The fact that they disagreed and that he showed that they disagreed is why he criticizes his teacher with hat in hand. What 
why did why did uh, if that, all that being said why do you think Lakatoche um created such a buzz around himself at some point in your work you say it's the Lakatoche era it's a Lakatoche phenomena um what what was it about him was he a charismatic person if because it seems yes, to be he surely was a charismatic person but that's not enough he saw a situation which was impossible it is to say Popper was ostracized, but there was no censorship. So Popper's ideas were floating. And sooner or later, they had to acknowledge Popper one way or another. The person who tried to do it, and sincerely and so on, was Peter Hamper. Mm. Hamper restated Popper's philosophy and said, and I'm quoting, whether Popper would agree with my restatement, I do not know. This is a quotation, word for word. Mm. So Hamper, at least in this respect, was honest. He was dishonest in other respects, but vis-a-vis -vis Popper, he was honest. And Lokatos was not. Let's go to your, um, there's so much more I, I want to ask you about. Let's go to your falling out with Popper. And I'm, I'm, I might quote you here, because this is interesting. You write that you were just emerging from your status as research assistant. And uh, you published this review of objective knowledge, and you write, "He actually scoffed at me. I was used. I was used to him shouting at me when I was his, when I was his an assistant, but I was not used to being scoffed at." Um, what was um, Popper's reaction to you publishing a critical review of objective knowledge, and me, why, why did let, he behave in such a reactive let me, way? Let me report a fact: objective knowledge, second edition has a reply to critics and it answers all his critics. Now he couldn't be ignorant of the fact that I published a criticism of it because this was our major falling out. And yet I'm not mentioned there. I find this not only an insult, I find this much more. You're right, it's better, it's any, any criticism is better than dismissal or, or oversight. And, uh, yeah, and Popper Pop, Pop, Pop must have known that as well. He must have known. He that. had an excuse. He said, my criticism of his objective knowledge was not a criticism, but an ad hominem. How, you, how, how was he different in public? Was he angry that you did it in public rather than in private? Oh, yes, of course, he wanted all the criticism of him in private. And he said, I'm still alive. Why don't you give me the criticism? If you publish it, you don't trust me. What I've just said is outrageous, just outrageous. Who is proper to decide what criticism should go public and what not? How do you reconcile that with the man and his philosophy? Because if you, if you take his philosophy seriously, it's hard to take that attitude of his seriously. Your, your question assumes that I reconcile. Is it possible to reconcile in any way? Because I can't I see a way. I, mm. I never tried to reconcile. You see, I have Talmudic education. Mm. I was trained to reconcile from childhood. And if I wanted to have a good career, I would be a Talmudist because that was where I excelled. And I left the Talmud because I found reconciliation too easy and too uninteresting and too and not sufficiently open and honest. And I did not leave the reconciliation of the Talmud to reconcile with Papa. How did that um, 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 separation from Papa how long did it last for? Did it last uh, for a significant period of time? Did you ever reconcile with him personally in any way? Or was yes, it a... yes, I I wrote his letter of reconciliation in my book. The last page of the book is his acceptance of my reconciliation with him. How you, there's, a, there's a very inter interesting line here, and I'm going to quote you again here. You say, I have a constant sense of failure due to my inability to sustain reasonably good relations with the person to whom I am most indebted. So how, does right. it, how did it affect you personally, this idea? Because even though it, it, it must be an incredibly challenging thing to be cut off and dismissed in this way. Cut off is the right word. He, 
when we were in a room together, he didn't see me. You mean he just ignored your presence in the room? <laughs> Read it as you like, but the fact mm. is he refused to see me. When he gave a public talk and I asked the question when there was a question and answer period, when he came to answer me, he said, I'm sure Agassi knows these things better than I. Mm. This, um, you're right. And of course, Popper actually says this himself, that criticism is a sign for, of appreciation. Yeah. And he, he he struggled to see this in when his own work was being criticized, it seemed. Again First of all, this is, the thesis, this is the thesis of Plato's Gorgias. Mm. So this is not new, that criticism is a sign of appreciation and that criticism is goodwill. Both are said in the Gorgias. Um, you have a wonderful metaphor for this, and it's medicine, and I think this is good. And you say, "No, no, uh, no! This is this is Gorgias." Yeah, but you 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 apply uh, your own metaphor. I apply it, but I want to say, Socrates yeah. says, "There is a doctor who gives you sweets, and there is a doctor who gives you bitter medicine. Whom would you prefer?" I think your metaphor is better. I'm just gonna. I'll, I'll, I think yours is, is is more cutting. Actually, you're right. You make my day. No, I, I will, I'll <laughs> I'll I'll read it back to you and see what you think personally. You write uh, medicine is at times very pleasing and at times very unpleasant. It may hurt, but it never hurts the ego, and that's the way philosophy of science and all philosophy should be. That's right. I only echo the Gorgias. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I I'm complimented. <laughs> So why do so? You touched on something there, which is um, this, this this nagging need within us, you know, to be right all the time, and you trace it back often to um, childhood and education, and this nagging need to be to prove our teacher, not prove, but be right in the eyes of our teachers and parents. Yeah, it's very funny if you have a good teacher and you say something outlandish, your good teacher, first of all, would praise you. And that is the sign of the good teacher, regardless of what you say. Mm -hmm. It would encourage you. You see, looking at the history of thought, you, or history of art, or history of religion, you always find uh, golden ages, that's the word for it, you know, periods of excitement. Uh, Paris painting, 19th century, pow! Mm. Uh, Greece, philosophy, pow! Yeah, you know, this kind of uh, uh, brilliance. And I, I'm the only one who asked the question, what makes for golden ages? I have a paper called that by that name. When I wrote the paper, I looked for other papers on it and I found none. And I, the question, what makes for golden ages, which is so obvious and so straightforward, I'm the first to ask. And I wrote a paper on it, which is the only paper on it. And I can give you the answer in one word, yeah. encouragement. I'll give you an example. Yeah, please, yes. The Renaissance, each Artists had a workshop, and the workshop had assistants, usually kids. That was the standard. And the story is that when Leonardo da Vinci was a kid, he was given the task of usually the kids had, that is to say, to paint the margins of a painting. <clears throat> the master would paint a portrait, and the kids would fill in the details of the background. And Kids went to the master and told him <clears throat> that Leonardo excelled. This is to me one of the most marvelous stories that you have in Vasari. That kids told the master that one of them, Leonardo, excelled. Mm. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. This is encouragement. 
Uh, usually, when you come with some wild idea, who do you think you are? Now, who do you think you are is one of the nastiest questions I ever heard in my life. Who do you think you are? Mm. And if I got a penny for each time I heard <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. So if you, I mean, I know you've spent a lot of time um, writing and thinking and, of course, involved in education. So what is it? Is there just too much coercion involved in it these days? And what should it look like, or at least on paper? I, I ask myself what coercion should be. And I, here I agree with Popper. <clears throat> Popper said the only coercion permissible is the three R's. Nowadays, we can say only two because uh, you have computers. There's um, a point, I think it's later in the book, I don't have it in front of me just now on a different page, and you say one of the great legacies of Popper is going to be the destruction of the of the um, the handbook or the compulsory reading for a course. So yes. is, is a compulsory curriculum uh, inherently a bad idea? I told you, it's a good idea for the three hours. Is it possible to be selective in this way and simply say... I think well, it's good. Look, mm. look, there are funny things. When you study physics, you begin with Galileo and Kepler and go to Newton. When you study mathematics, you get basic algebra and basic geometry as first year. In every university in the world, mathematics first year, algebra and geometry. You ask a mathematician, why it's at all obviously it's like, go on tell me very very difficult here polani is so right people know this but can't explain why they know why but they can't put it to words very interesting the interesting thing about popper is when you criticized him he said to himself if i worked harder i would have found this criticism myself and this was his Achilles heel, his moralism. He blames himself for not noticing his criticisms before someone else does. He blamed not only himself, but he blamed himself regularly. Yes. You could not blame him, but no. he blamed himself all the time. How was it um, um, within the hierarchy? So it, when you worked under Popper, how, was there a certain hierarchy of is the, it, it? It always seems like a. I understand he's the teacher and you're the student, but there's a certain um, problem of a kind in every relationship like that. He's, he has let a certain me, authority over you and authority me, over knowledge. And yeah, let me tell you, whenever I left him, and this was, usually it was midnight. I would say to myself, "Don't dare complain. When you have too much, you leave him." And I shared this with my wife, of course. And one day she said to me, you always say when you have enough, you leave him. Today you have enough. So I left, went to him and I said, Carl, I'm staying your disciple, of course, but I'm not being your student anymore. And he said, Yosuke, you are right. I always talked about my agenda. Take back what you said and we discuss your agenda. And that for me was so, it was, a, it was an offer I could not refuse mm. for him to talk with me about my interest. So I said, Carl, you always refuse to talk ethics with me because you think it's boring. And I think ethics is interesting and I want to discuss ethics with you. He said, go ahead. What's your ethics? And I said, it's modified utilitarianism. So he said utilitarianism is not worth discussing and gave me a lecture. Now, first of all, I knew the lecture by heart before he opened his mouth. Secondly, I was not utilitarian ever. I said modified utilitarianism. Many years later, I mentioned this to him and he said, all humans make mistakes. He couldn't say, I'm sorry. He said, all humans make mistakes. So I said, I know that. And I burst laughing. Are you still a modified utilitarian? Yes. 
Can I ask uh, um, briefly what the modification is? It's our duty to be utilitarians. So a kind of um, deontological uh, element added in there. Added as a basic, mm. not just added as a margin, but as a central item. You spoke. Utilitarianism, mm, utilitarianism came to dispense with ethics. The utilitarians felt that preaching is wrong. So they wanted to prevent preaching. By the way, I do agree that preaching is usually wrong, not always, but usually wrong. And they said, if you naturalize morality, then there would be no room for preaching. So they said, uh, people tend to take care of themselves. Spinoza already said this, but Spinoza had a different agenda, so he doesn't fit here, but he already said. Mm. The, he said the law of inertia suffices, and the law of inertia is the wish to stay alive. And that's Spinoza, what I'm saying now. Yes. Uh, Tractatus Politicus, to be more precise. So it's a well-known idea. I'm not inventing it. I'm just referring to it. And Popper just misread me intentionally and went on his binge. So after, th after that moment, did he continue um, giving you uh, your voice in those discussions and to follow you? I mean, other than just the that brief ethical discussion, or was it uh, the end of, of Agassiz's be, voice? You must be kidding. <laughs> Popper never let anybody. Popper never stopped talking. He had already in Vienna, and he left Vienna when he was 34, I think, or 33. In Vienna, he had reputation of a person who talks and you can't put a word in edgeways. That Feyerabend told me that that was his reputation in Vienna. But you were going to ask me about Feyerabend. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far and I apologize for this brief interruption, but I will take this moment to briefly send out a plug for the podcast itself. The Popperian podcast is something that I've been planning for quite a while. And it's something that I want to keep running month to month. But to do so, it's going to need your help. If you're willing or able or interested, please go to the links below the podcast and support us however you can. It will be your help as listeners that keeps the podcast going and keeps the content coming out. And I thank you in advance. And with that said, we will now return to the second half of the interview. Thanks for listening. Uh, yes, well... I I might ask you about objective knowledge first. I want to ask you about Feyerabend and, and um, a little bit about Watkins as well briefly, but um, I might ask you about your, your actual criticism of objective knowledge, the book. And you write that um, this is a place where Popper is imposing himself a bit too much. Um, he's, you, I'm going to quote you again here. Uh, he seems to pursue a policy of arguing with a multitude of philosophers until they openly admit that all along he was right and that and they were not, and that the volume rejects it projects clearly an image of the author, a personal image. So is this Popper trying to build an image around himself in this book? And this no, is one of but this is the fact which is most conspicuous about Popper's daily conduct. That is to say, Popper criticizes inductivism. And by the way, he always invented more and newer and better arguments against inductivism, the latest being the one he developed together with David Miller, which is ingenious, mm. right or wrong, but ingenious. And you ask yourself, why does a man repeat a job that he did successfully the first time and in more and more ways? What is the purpose of it? Why doesn't say, as I have already showed, inductivism is wrong. He never said that. He said inductivism is wrong because, and he invented a new idea, always interesting and always brilliant and so on. I don't wish to belittle this for a moment. I wish to belittle the task, not the repeated performances. Why should a person repeat a task so many times? You 
you work your garden repeatedly because it needs reworking, but you don't re rework your asphalt or your uh, uh, paved uh, floor in your house. You, you know, you. There's, there's, there's also a point, I think you say that in fact, Popper is reworking the theory of uh, Goldschmidt here. And it uses this wonderful name for the theory, hopeful monsters. I think this is wonderful. And you say he's creating this um, model of macro evolution through macro mutations. And you say it already existed before Popper. The biological parallel exists before, yes. See what objective knowledge is la largely a repeat. It's a very interesting book, but the most important thing there is the biological foundation of criticism, where he says, from the amoeba to Einstein. And that's Goldschmidt. You, at, at one point, I, I, I might open this up to you. You say that Popper perhaps failed to apply his own canon, his own ideas, his own scientific method to his own theory in this place. And uh, at least one of the elements in that was if there are previous solutions not validly criticized, then we should accept them in, or not accept them, but at least the, um, you, you, sh you should uh, at least make, make mention of them. And Popper fails to make proper mention yeah. or perhaps some yeah. Again, the question is what does the word accept mean? Mm. For inductivists, accept means believe. And I think this is ridiculous as Robert Boyle and Spinoza have argued you cannot control your beliefs. You can try to concentrate on some arguments against your beliefs in the hope of undermining them some, but you can't control your beliefs. Have you ever found a person denying that he is a human born of a woman? I'm quoting the book of Job, of course. Mm -hmm. Nobody doubts that he's a human born of a woman. So when the says he doubts everything, even including his legs, the question is, does he deny that he was born to a woman? So was one of the problems with this book um, that Popper um, didn't have a problem he was trying to solve of a kind, that it's a grand idea, and you write, it's connecting the amoeba to, and Einstein all as problem solvers, but yet I his own theory Popper, doesn't solve a problem. I asked Popper, literally, Carl, what problem are you solving in this assertion? And he answered it at once. None. So it's a failure of Popper. I don't know. You can, I, I'm reporting to you a historical fact. He said none. Mm. And that's the only time in my experience that this happens. There's um, an image that Pop is building, uh, at least talking about himself. And you write that um, this is his pen portrait. And at one time, he says he's trying to build an idea that he's a forceful person, wonderfully straightforward. And, and, and at the other time, he's uh, indirect and constantly neglected by his peers around him. And um, yeah, at one point, you, you say it certainly depicts his peers as less brave than himself. So was Popper, was this a conscious thing he was trying to do? And yes. or why? Oh, yes. Why do you think it was? First of all, he certainly needed to excel all his life. I don't know what drove him, but all his life he was driven. I understand that in his last days he was content. And the last book that was published after his death has a different tone. I wrote a review of it saying that. I was very impressed with this. Mm. fact that the last book, which is posthumous, uh, is much more relaxed than anything else he wrote. Now, look, The Open Society is one of the greatest books of the century. And I don't wish to belittle it uh, by a jot, but certainly it's not a relaxed book. It's not the style of Bertrand Russell or Somerset Maugham. There is a 
story by Somerset Moen, which he starts talking about smoking. And then he leaves this and goes on. And he explains that he talks about smoking to relax his reader. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yes. Let's talk about um, Full Fire Abend. Yeah. Um, you, how how close were you? You seem to. Uh, I I read a long um, review a while back of the papers um, and Fireabend's letters, and it appeared that uh, during Fireabend's um, um, fallout with Popper, you seem to be um, uh, a a go between of time, trying to bridge the gap and trying to. Oh, I tried very hard. Yes. Uh, I I have to say. But Fire said to me once, Yoske, are you sure you don't mind if you won't be considered the greatest philosopher alive? And then I called him Dr. Columbus. Uh, we were very close friends. And uh, finally, I asked him to stop corresponding with me. I cut him off. Why did you cut him off? He said, anything go. Mm -hmm. And I responded by saying, not everything, not Auschwitz. And then he, he said, Agassi is a prig. And that was enough for me. And he complained that I don't know the difference between the personal and the public, meaning that what he said on me public was not to be taken personally. I'm not ready for that. Did, was, was he, this is gonna be a strange question. Was he serious when he said those things? Because I've had people tell me that it's hard to know how serious he's being sometimes. What he told me is that I was wrong taking seriously what he said. When he started Everything Goes, I corresponded with him. I published his correspondence. Mm. And I said, that's too much. And he said, he doesn't mean it, but he wants to tease his public. So fire opens, anything goes, applies beyond the philosophical realm and into the um, the into the political realm as well. I know you talk about anything goes means authoritarianism goes as well. Um, but I know fire Robin wrote a, a response to you in that. And he said, um, it's temporary. Perhaps that authoritarianism or that anarchy is like the medicine and it's a temporary <laughs> thing. Yeah, that's what he said. Mm. But it's not true. For example, in his correspondence with Lokatos, he has one expression that moved me greatly. He, he says to Lokatos about Popper that he is our stumbling block. And he says it in Latin, lapis irae. Popper being a stumbling block. To what? to their claims for fame, no, no more than that. He was heavily accused of plagiarizing Popeye. Do you think he did? He plagiarized everybody. He said, Mozart plagiarized, why shouldn't I? Did he plagiarize you? I don't mind being plagiarized. <laughs> I've been, look, I've invented at least two fields in philosophy. And in these fields, people don't mention me. I don't mind that I'm not proper. So was Feyerabend a good philosopher, regardless of this? Because at some point you say he plays the clown, but he is not the clown. What he is, I cannot say. Um, but it, it, was there any serious, and it was, there must have been some strain of seriousness in Feyerabend. He, he must have been a very- he was one of the most learned people I know. Hmm. And he nevertheless tried to impress people more. He had a simple technique. I'll tell you what it is. You can do it too. He would look at the standard texts, look at the references, and take those least known and get the books from the library and open the references and take out the least known and mention them in his bibliographies as if he read them. Mm -hmm. This is tantalizing. This technique is superb. It's not honest, and therefore I wouldn't recommend it, but it's superb. Mm -hmm. And 
I once talked to him, I remember, like now we were very close friends, let me say again. Yeah. I, I asked him, what are you really afraid of? And he said to me, he was afraid that the veil would fall and people will see that he is hollow. Now this is man, one of the most learned people I ever met who feels that he is phony because he didn't read enough. And he's afraid that people will expose him as phony. Let me continue the story for you. Yeah, 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 please, yeah. I said, you don't have to be afraid of it. So he was delighted and he said, are you sure? And I said, absolutely. So he said, why? And I said, because the veil fell. So he held the wall. I remember reading a while ago, um, Fire Up and um, criticizing Popper, or at least explaining why he, he, he left. And he said he had a certain revulsion to the idea that there was a Popperian school building. And he used to call it the Popperian church and, and yeah. denigrate people like Lakatosh as the high priest and things like this. First Is, of all, on this, I am in 100% agreement with both mm. of them. Secondly, I want to mention why did he stop being Popperian and attack Popper. Yeah. You don't know it, and I'll tell you, then you'll know. There was the strongest and the leading philosopher of science in the United States. What's his name? Was it Kuhn? Minnesota Studies. Who published Minnesota Studies in Philosophy of Science? I'm not sure. Either way. Yeah. He said to him, you publish one criticism of Popper and I give you any academic job you want. So part of this was career building in fire up in science, you think? He, he got exactly the job he wanted. By the way, at a certain time, he had three academic jobs running yeah. together. Yeah. Berkeley, Yale, and Berlin. Mm. And you know, he was Yale and Berlin. I, I think he was the most successful academic I ever come across or whose name I ever heard. How, well, I, I, I enjoy reading your writing and some of it is quite biting. So how did he respond to your writing? Because the first sentence of your review of Fire Abin's book um, you're, you're, the title is Fire Abin's Defense of Voodoo, How to Get Away with Murder. And the first line says, how do you read a book which extols lies? And the lie he's telling, of course, is when he says that Galileo is a charlatan of a kind. So how did he respond to such forceful criticism? Was he a good Popperian in that sense? Oh, yes, decidedly. Not only that, he always agreed with my criticism. You see, one of the things that he said in his correspondence with me. Uh, as you know, I have medical issues all my life, every day. You know, he was a cripple, yes? I, did, I didn't know that, but I know he wrote about his medical issues a lot, yeah. He was a cripple and mm. he was in pain every day and he was on drugs all his life and so on. Uh, this, this is as genuine as it can. By the way, he got crippled. This is unbelievable. He was a soldier in the Nazi army and it was a great retreat and he got off a car and he stood in the middle of the road and directed traffic. If this is not heroic, I don't know what is. Mm. And of course he got shot because he did that so well. Mm. And he got shot at the back of his uh, spinal cord. So he got crippled for the rest of his life and in pain all his life. How, how, how much of a motivator was that? Because I know he wrote about his pain in his response to you. And he said, his anything goes is like, I've been to so many doctors and they can't help me. And then I found a Chinese medicine person and a masseuse and a spiritualist. And, 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 and when we met and we talked about it, he said, yes, I'm telling the truth. I went to all sorts of voodoo doctors, but I never let them touch me. And I never followed their advice. So he lied. Oh, okay. Okay. That is to say, 
he told half truth, but in a very misleading manner. Mm. He wrote as if he prefers voodoo doctors to real doctors, but in fact, it was just a part of his stack. He could watch television for hours watching people walk. In envy, do you think? Oh, yeah. mm. uh, by the way, it's very interesting. He was a superb lecturer. Mm. He would always put little girls in the front line, in the front row, sitting, you know, with mini skirts and crossed legs. And he would talk directly to the cunts. And the talk would be saturated with sex. And he was so successful, I can't tell you. You know, it was, the air was electrified when he talked. And then, and that I know it from, from him. People would ask him for the manuscript and he didn't have any, he always improvised. So people said, I want it out. By the way, I knew what to do. I recorded his speech and published it without any change or hesitation, it was superb. But he told me they wanted the manuscript and he said, I don't have any. So they said, write it down and I'll publish it. He would go home and sit down before the typewriter and the flat page and neighbors would bring him food and he wouldn't eat and he would collapse. And when he awoke from his collapse, he saw a paper and he took out the last page from the typewriter, put the paper in an envelope and wrote the address. He couldn't read his own writings. That's, that's I have his book on my shelf and mm -hmm. I read it and it, 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 it writes, it reads quite well. He's, it, he's a very good writer though. Um, and oh, Superb. Mm. He, as I tell you, he was one of the most talented people I ever met. He was one of the most learned people, ever, not the most, the most learned person was Buba, but I really meant learned. By the way, Karl Popper was not learned. I always brought him books that he didn't know. Fireabend, there's at least one person he didn't know until strangely late in his life, Fireabend, and that was um, John Stuart Mill. And he seems to be greatly influenced by, by Mill. So how, how much did Mill yeah, flex his... Every word, every word you say is a lie. Ah, I, 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 was, I was reading a book a while ago, and this was saying that he found Mill oh, late yes, in his yes, life. I know, I know mm. that you quote it right. Mm. It's a lie. I don't call you a liar. No, 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 no. <laughs> so so he, knew, he knew of Mill much earlier in life. Because the story, the classical story goes like this in books like this. He was a young man who needed a, a godlike figure above him. And he found Karl Popper. And when he lost Karl Popper, he needed another. And then he found John Stuart Mill. And that sounds, uh, well, that's just the, too much storytelling, is it? Let me tell you the true story. Please, yeah. Bert Brecht wanted him to be his assistant and follower. Niels Bohr wanted him to be his follower and his assistant. Karl Popper wanted him to be his follower and his assistant. He couldn't be more successful even if he tried. Did he ever feel successful, do you think? Never. I told you he felt hollow. I told you today that he felt mm. hollow. So how, how could he have, this is a bit of psychologism, but how do you think he could have felt hollow? As you said, he wrote these wonderful books. He was so incredibly learned and he performed so well in front of crowds that adored him. And yet he still felt. You, you surprise me. This is so common. I don't understand you. Some of the most learned people felt that way. Did you ever feel that way? Never. What's different I, in your constitution to him? I, I was in my early 20s, I was suicidal. How does that change your... your... Oh, I, I came out of my attempted suicide in, in a conscious way of trying to make my own life. I so, decided whether hmm. you are happy or not depends on you. 
and you think people like fire rubber never came to that to that crisis moment and and figured that out on the contrary he lived it every day it was, it was the fact that he had to live it every day that was the challenge you see the point is he was impotent mm. and people feel that he was impotent because of his wound but I know he was impotent before and uh, He was married four times, and I didn't know his first wife, but I knew his second, third, and fourth. A last question on Fire Arben, um, and this is into uh, the core of his thesis about anything goes, and one of the things he doesn't like is he says science is dominated by um, the great scientists, and he talks about von Neumann as a terrorist of a kind, terrorizing the lower scientists. Um, I'm sure you disagree with this, but um, why, what is wrong with this view? Is he simply, um, is he making this up, or is he, or has he I seen this? I am came to London as an admirer of von Neumann. And he and Popper and I discussed von Neumann again and again and again. The first publication that he had was about von Neumann and Karl Popper said, you are a plagiarist. We three discussed it together. After mm. my first publication, Popper fell out with him. Mm. I of course didn't mind, but Popper did. And he admired von Neumann because he was interested in quanta, he was interested in logic, and he wanted to know how to resolve the EPR. It's all, I don't understand it, kind of self-denigration, which makes no sense to me. How was, um, how was your relationship with John Watkins? Uh, I, he, he has this- He was Uh, Lokatosh managed to put a wedge between us, but we ended, friend, ended up friends. Um, it, was he, um, I've, I've read again, it's probably not quite right, that he's a gatekeeper of a kind for Popper, that people say that he was the, um, the, the, the closest consort of Popper and, and stuck with him. And, uh... My last conversation with Watkins, he said, Carl is a liar. Can I ask you what he was a liar about or what Watkins was speaking about? Oh, most of Popper's autobiographical remarks are fantasy. Oh. And uh, I remember when Popper plagiarized for me, I was ashamed. By the way, he plagiarized for me something extremely unimportant. So I'm not saying he plagiarized for me because I have a claim for anything, no. But the fact that he plagiarized for me was done magnificently. He, when I wrote the formula that he overlooked, I knew that he would generalize it and claim priority. So I put it in a most general way. So he put it in a less general way. And then he published it putting his formula and added Agassi generalized it and put my formula. So the only word which is a lie is the word generalized. Very ingenious. And when I read this, I was ashamed for him because the formula is not worth stealing, but he stole it from me. And that is, you see, Popper, who was not only the most, one of the most intelligent people I knew. He was also a very wise man, a very wise man. And he behaved foolishly. That doesn't make sense. One of the things that um, Watkins does, at least um, I believe, I, um, he's, you, you, you're right, um, he shuns verisimilitude. Um, And he begins to break this down and he tries to remove it. At least that's what it appears. So how did um, 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 Watkins, I mean, he's, you also write, you also go into that question of, co of corroboration again when it comes to Watkins. Yes, so so see, how, how does he deal with these two things? Because so they seem, seem to be interlinked here. Watkins wrote a book 
and Popper found this book a uh, kind of treason. And what was, you know, he was an English military man. Yes. And to insult Watkins is much worse than to insult, say, Lokatos. I, he had a very strong sense of dignity and a very fragile one, by the way. And you know, he, he, he had a medal, Distinguished Service Cross. So he, he, he really had something to be proud of. And somehow, I, I don't know, it was, it was sad. I, I, I must say he, he died uh, disappointed. He had a writing block, he published very little. And I don't know, after he died, I rang his wife and said I would be glad to publish his collected works, but she, she found me not reliable. So nothing came of it. He tries to draw this line between corroboration and verisimilitude, and um, he, he begins, there's a question, I might just open the question up to you. Is a increase in corroboration for whatever it's worth um, does that amount to an increase in verisimilitude and vice versa in any way? Or is this a, a completely inductive mistake? I wrote a paper on this. Mm. And Popper, I sent Popper a copy of the paper, published it in mine. Mm. And Popper was incensed. The paper is called To Save Verisimilitude. Yeah. And Popper said, I know what your aim was. My aim was to say very similitude. But Popper, you see, this is what people don't know about Popper. Popper was always suspicious. Everything any of his students wrote, he suspected was meant to undermine him, to demote him, to belittle him. It was very funny. Mm. Popper was a spoiled brat. That's oh. what he was. So, is very is similitude savable still in your eyes? They said, I, I think I saved it. But the person who is really the heir of Popper is David Miller. I don't know if you know. I've reached out to him, yes. Yeah. And David Miller first thought little of my to say very similitude and then he agreed that one has to consider it. I don't know. I mean, I haven't changed my mind about it, but who am I to testify about myself? It's ridiculous. So the question is open. The main question is what is the good of very similitude? Why is very similitude so important? The man who invented the very similitude is Einstein. And uh, I don't know what you think about it, but I am the person who t told Popper that Einstein had very similitude. Popper didn't have anything like that in mind. Not only that, but Logic de Forschung has at least one chapter that comes to answer the question, how come all scientists agree with each other? Mm. And I, perhaps because of my Talmudic education, I don't know, I always see in science disagreements. For example, in optics, there is a disagreement whether it's particles or waves from the beginning till today. And I see this as the standard case. I say, if there is only one opinion, then it's because the other opinion doesn't have enough to base it. For example, Leibniz disagreed with Newton, but didn't have enough mathematics to create an alternative to Newton. So, is any, by the way, this is what Einstein said, that between Leibniz and Newton, Leibniz was right, but Newton had the technique and Leibniz did not. Mm. So these things are open, and I rather here follow Einstein. I think there is always disagreements and these are always welcome and so on. And 
I really don't know what Popper's opinion about this agreement is, because certainly in the lobby of the Forschung, he's against this agreement, and he has a trilemma that he tries to resolve. And then I told him that it is redundant. He got very angry with me. I don't know. It's hard for me to say. Mm. The first time Popper yelled at me was when he found a way to attack Carnap. And I said to him, Carnap is not worth attacking. Now, as you know, Carnap was the most celebrated philosopher in during his lifetime. Mm. And I wrote a paper called The Secret of Carnap, in which I said it is not worth thinking about. And this was the first time Popper yelled at me when I said Carnap is not worth attacking. At last, um, you know, I, I, I've kept you a long time, so I have a, a few questions um, around about. The, you wrote a, a, a paper um, called The Myth of the Young Genius. And yes. w- when I first picked it up, I, 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 I thought, yes, there's an obvious answer to this. Not all, not all geniuses were infant prodigies at some point. And yet yeah. you go on to write very early on that you've spoken to many artists and media people and scholars and scientists. And the very question of this re- greatly troubles them. So why do so many people are so keen to make this connection between um prodigious youth and 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 greatness as a, at, a, at, a, at another age. And why did it bother so many people, the question? Why does it trouble them? Just think of Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn wrote his best music when he was 17. Midsummer Night's Dream music. Don't know if you know that piece. Very famous. Yeah. How would you feel if you were a Mendelssohn? if you would feel that your the productive part of your life is over when you are 18, 19. Or take Shostakovich. Some people, including me, think that Shostakovich's first symphony is his best. He wrote it when he was 18, something like that. How would you feel when you were, if you were a Shostakovich? Mm. See, I'm 95 years old. I'm very old. And I go on writing as a kind of habit or something like that, but I had my say many years ago. So it feels like, (laughs) you know, so you go on. Did you have your best say in your young, very young life, 18, 20, 21, 22, those kind of years? Before before I met Popper. Mm. And let me tell you what was for me so great. In the history of philosophy, there are inductivists and there are deductivists. There's only one fellow hardly known who said both induction and deduction are operative. And that, by the way, is Friedrich Engels in his Anti-During, I don't know if you know. It's a very famous Marxist book. But this is the only man who said it also doesn't explain, doesn't discuss, just say it. But the idea that you can both go bottom up and top down doesn't exist. That, why? Because they get into conflict. What does Popper say? You have a conflict that's very good. So are the older people in this area, there's a chapter towards the end here, you talk about gatekeepers and, and the challenges that they hold on. You're right. Our establishment acts as a gang of bouncers rather than brokers and auctioneers. And there's a wonderful quote. I'm going to read this one. You're right. Um, You talk about the the old people watching the young people within their profession. And you say, I view older colleagues and their senior advisors as those who have already fallen off the cliff, who do not dare move a limb for fear that they discover that their bones are already broken. So uh, am I, is there a, a, a huge amount of gatekeeping? within the establishment today and... and um, Of course, most professors I know are, get, are gatekeepers. Why are they gatekeepers, do you think? Is, 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 it, a, is it a fear of, of, of the young people below them, as you mentioned there? See, one of my greatest heroes is Michael Faraday. Yes. And Faraday wrote, if I be superseded, then so be <laughs> it. Mm. But he did not welcome it. Mm. 
And he was very brave and very honest. He was one of the most honest people I ever read. And I wonder why does it feel so bad to be superseded? Take the question of the immortality of the soul. I mean, nobody denies that you have a soul because we know the difference between living and dead. But the question is, is the soul immortal? Now, contemplate in immortality always raises questions. What happens? Where do the souls go to? How do they behave and so on? Now, this is not important. Think of mortality. Think of people you like, like your parents or your uncles or your teacher, and think they are dead. And think they are dead as a dodo. They are dead as a piece of rock. Does that bother you? That they are one at one time. Now, the funny thing is that the only author who answered this question is Karl Popper. And he says, even though humanity is finite, the fact that there is morality and that there are moral people signifies, even if it's all limited and at one time in the whole history of the universe. This, by the way, is done in re response to uh, Russell. Russell talked desperately about the fact that the universe is all hostile. It's either empty, but so unlivable, or, or too hot or too cold. And even the Earth is only livable on in a very part of its crust. And he says the whole of it is less than the first sailor in Hamlet, who says, good, good day, sir. What is this first sailor to Hamlet? If you omit it, nobody notices, you know. And Russell felt very bad about Russell's best known piece is Free Man's Worship. And he found mortality very hard to accept. And Popper says, no, even if it is limited and so on, the world is better for it. And that I found very interesting. How does Popper fit into that picture? This is interesting because at one point you say Karl Popper, the last of the great gatekeepers. But of course, yeah. um, I'm, I'll get you to explain exactly what we mean by that, of course. But also, he also, you write later on how, how Popper freed science from these ideas of certainty and reductionism. And it, so he seems to sit in these two ways. He frees it up and yet he's also behaving no, as a no, gatekeeper. No, and this is for me a response which is please very rude, but let me tell you. To you. Go, go. You don't understand anything. I, I had to play it, so it's not the word. <laughs> you don't understand anything. Uh, the peak of Popper's career was when he gave a talk at the Salzburg Festival. You know what the Salzburg Festival? I do, I've heard it, yeah. He gave a talk about Kepler. The next day, the Frankfurter Allgemeiner Zeitung, which is perhaps the most important journal, general written daily, had his lecture fully on a whole page with his picture in the middle, large size with his big ears. You know? mm. And his wife said to him, now you cannot complain anymore. And he said to her, you don't understand anything. This is a heartbreaking story, I must tell you, when I heard it, and I really admired her, I can't tell you how, mm. how much I appreciated her. You don't understand yeah. anything. As he said, he realized that his thirst is in insatiable. Insatiable. Mm. Well, as a as as a last question, then I might ask you, uh, how should we, how how should we disagree? Because there's this wonderful quote, of course, the po the positive power of negative thinking, and uh, so much of this book in front of me is about how criticism is liberation, 
And you yeah, wrote in it as you were a younger man and you said, I used to use words like war and attack and quarrel. And then you began to change them and you, you, you preferred discussion and debate. So uh, is, is there a right and a wrong way to disagree? Or is, is no, it all? No, first, of all, first of all, this is all concessions. Mm. When I find uh, the nastiest criticism, let's say Fayam and Lokatos contra Popa, Mm. which in my experience is the nastiest. I mean, there are nasty things elsewhere, but I'm thinking of my uh, back garden. They're, they are the worst. I wrote a book against them. And I said, first of all, I clean the criticism of its hostility. I don't know if you've seen this book of mine. I've, I've seen, and, I have, yeah. Uh, yes, I have I'm seen it. I'm yeah. proud of it, although it's a very small thing and... Mm. Uh, not original in any sense. I am very proud of it. Mm. One last question then. Any advice to young people entering academia these days? Because when you, I remember you saying a story once before when you, you worked under Popper and he said, don't try and get a PhD. Don't follow the structures of this just study. Is, is that advice still stand for young people? Yes, but mainly, mainly my advice is, remember the professors will discourage you, don't worry about it. By the way, I had one luck. I had uh, as a professor, uh, Abraham Frankel, although I was not a mathematician, I was a student of his for some mathematics. And he, he was terrific. He was a man full of encouragement and goodwill and understanding. He was perhaps a supreme teacher. I'm not, not speaking of him as a mathematician. He was world mm. famous, but as a teacher. He was a supreme teacher. First personal question then. Are you a good teacher? I've spoken to some of your students and they said you must speak to Agassiz. So they have a good um uh, they hold a, 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 a very positive um, feeling about you. There, so, were students, there were students who disliked me very much, and I know why. And I always discourage students. I always said in my first lecture, if you don't come again, I will not take it personally. And uh, I always ask people, why do you come here? Why do you write a PhD and so on? And this makes me unpopular because people don't like me to put a mirror before them. But that's the best service I can do. And I flatter myself only in one point. I think I always try to encourage everybody. That is also a, a great note to end the podcast on. Um, of course, I'll link um, Joseph's book below, but of course, also his um, biography and personal website. We can find all his articles and um, I can't recommend them enough. Joseph, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. You made my day. Thank you so much.